Let me say that one more time. Good morning, church. I welcome you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit into this special service as we come together to worship and praise our Lord. Um, if you have a prayer concern that you would like to share with me, please send that over. Uh, request or celebrations to prayer at PVUMC, and uh, we'll get that information. Um, last week, we had a couple of wonderful events. We had Ash Wednesday service here, uh, both at 10 and also at 6.30, and probably one of the, the really exciting things that happened was Betty and Stephen Gamboa came forward for ashes. And uh, after the service, uh, Betty Gamboa said to me, it's because of Jesus and your prayers that she was able to walk forward to receive those ashes. So that's a, that's a praise right there. That's a praise. And it's good to have Stephen and Be Betty with us here today. So she wanted to let you guys know that. And also we had the Valentine's Day dance yesterday. Uh, it was a great time for music and uh, all generations were we're there, and we had just a wonderful, wonderful time. And so for the youth and all who put that together, thank you so very much. I want to draw your attention to a few uh, announcements today following church. Uh, we are going to have the Lenten study that will be, that will be, be meeting in the fellowship hall. Um, the study will be the last supper on the moon. There will be a meal provided, so everyone is welcome to attend on that as well. Um, if it hasn't been filled out yet, there are, we still need two people to count money for today. So if you would like to stay after and, and help with that, that would be outstanding. I also want to draw your attention, there is a yellow pad. Uh, we are going to have a Seder meal on March 28th at, uh, and we need to know how many people are going to be here. Uh, so. Uh, put your name on there and how many fam family members are going to be there. It's going to be a full meal, and we're going to learn how Jesus fits into the Seder message. And so I really invite everyone to come for that. It'll be a great, great time. So those are our announcements at this time now. Let us worship and praise our Lord.
Good morning. Please stand as you are able and join in the call to worship. Brothers and sisters, let us draw closer to the cross of Christ. As we come together to pray, let us cross off our own most selfish interests. For Jesus did not exploit his divine nature, but emptied himself of all privilege and became human. He was obedient to the point of death. Even death on the cross. Today, let us ask the Holy Spirit to lead us in our prayers, to focus our minds and thoughts on that which God reveals to us. Even Lord, be our leader and our guide. Crucify our selfish interests and renew our community through the transformation of our souls. Amen. Please remain standing as you're able and join in the hymn of promise from the larger hymnal and projected on the screen, number 432. come to our time of prayers. Uh, we uh, lift up Stephen and Betty Gamboa. Uh, Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. the Williams uh, family with the passing of Randy's father, we pray for comfort and, uh, and peace to be upon them. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. Doris Troy, who's with us as well, um, we just thank you for the God grace uh, that's been upon her as she heals. And so we lift this in our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. 
We do lift up Joan in our prayers. She's dealing with an infection, and she is now uh, going through uh, multiple weeks of physical therapy. So as uh, she's away from her family, we lift this in prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Carol Hollander, we lift in our prayers. She has uh, pneumonia. She's home, uh, but uh, she's still dealing and healing from that. So this we lift in our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Uh, We have birthdays to announce. Kyra Packer, Janice Naylor, Sonia Alvarado, and Tony uh, Tony, uh, Harshberger, uh, who all have birthdays. So please tell them happy birthday. And I do want to thank our sound team, our video team, ushers and greeters, those who are preparing the meal, uh, chancel choir staff, and all who have gone to make this service very special. So with that, would you please pray with me? Let's pray. Oh, gracious and almighty God, we think of the time that you stooped down and you washed the disciples' feet, how you lovingly looked into each one of their eyes and did what a servant would do. Father, you set a a great example for us of how we are to live our lives for you here in this world. For it is through serving and loving others that people know that we are Christians. And so, Father God, I do pray for this season of Lent that's upon us. I pray for our our faith. May you help it to grow in this season. And may you help us to find ways to serve you. Maybe to get down on our hands and knees and to wash someone's feet, maybe to uh, assist someone who's struggling financially. Maybe it's just to give a kind word when needed. Lord, work in and through us in all things and help us to be your hands and feet. Father God, we thank you for the many answered prayers that we had here this week and for how you're working in our lives Be with those who are struggling to make ends meet. Be with those who are dealing with sickness. Be with those who are facing challenges and they they struggle to see where the light of day is, is even before them. Encourage them. Give them the hope, Lord. I pray for today's message. I pray that you would speak in and through me, and as I step aside, may you step in, and I pray for open hearts to receive what you have in store for us. Oh, Father God, you are so good and worthy of all praise, and I pray all these things in Christ Jesus' holy name. But at this time now, I invite the entire congregation to pray in one voice the prayer that Jesus taught his early disciples to pray, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This time now, can the young disciple of all ages please come forward for this, uh, for the young disciple message with Miss Mary. (laughs) Good morning. Come on up, everybody. There you are. Hello. First of all, There we go. Okay. I want to have a big round of applause and thank you to the youth for organizing the Valentine's dance last night. Can we give them a round of applause, please? 
we had a lot of fun and literally I was the marketing person. I printed some flyers and sign up sheets and they planned everything. They had the idea, they um, gathered all the decorations from downstairs and um, put everything out and um, really advertised for that. So we had a really wonderful time last night. So um, today is the first Sunday in Lent. And that is a period of time in which we remember the life of Jesus and the sacrifice he made for us before he was risen from the dead on Easter. Now, as you know, Jesus lived an amazing life, performing miracles and spreading the word of God to people. But he wasn't alone. He had 12 disciples or followers who were with him. And one of them was Judas, who kept the money for the group. Maybe something like this. Now, have any of you guys ever had a huge bag of gold like this before? Uh, Grace is like, I wish, girl. No, never. So I think it would be really tempting to take some money out of it when no one was watching and use it on yourself, wouldn't it? Yeah, we're only human after all, and sometimes we can get greedy with money. And actually, what I found in the Christmas program, since one of our wise men carried this, it was a little less heavy, but these coins at the bottom are not coins, they're chocolate coins, and I'm going to tell on them, they were so tempted by this chocolate, some of the youth ate this possibly decades-old chocolate in this bag. So there's still wrappers, they're expired. There's still wrappers in here from Christmas. It was just so tempting, this delicious old chocolate. So that kind of reminds me of an old commercial for an ice cream bar that maybe you guys won't know, but probably all of us will know. So if Media Men can play that for me real quick. That's my chicken. What would you do for a Klondike bar? Would you be a chicken for a Klondike bar? <laughs> yeah, how about you? <laughs> yeah, no pluck, no Klondike. <laughs> oh, nice chicken. For that chocolate-coated ice cream, loaded big and thick, no room for snakes. What would you do for a Klondike bar? <laughs> Just a few more clucks. <laughs> okay. Does everyone remember that? I still have it in my head. I can't remember important things like doctor's appointments, but I have the Klondike bar commercial jingle in my head. So that wasn't the only commercial. There were tons of commercials throughout 80s and 90s. Um, There were ones where people had to make monkey noises and two bodybuilders played patty cake in order to earn this ice cream sandwich. Um, So they all embarrassed themselves pretty quickly for something that was simple, that would be eaten and forgotten quickly, right? So, and never, you'll never forget the Klondike bar. Okay, well, they're not that good, you know? They're, okay, all right. (laughs) So, okay, okay, thank you. So in our scripture for today, Jesus tells his disciples that he knows that one of them will betray him. And unsurprisingly, that ends up being Judas, who knows all about that temptation of money. And he tells the authorities who Jesus is and where to find him in exchange for 30 silver pieces. He sent Jesus to his death because he was greedy. We have a lot of instances in life where we have to choose which path to take. Do we stand up for a friend who's being bullied and risk being punched in the face ourselves? Yes. Okay, well, okay, all right. Do we find a wallet full of money and use it to buy a new iPhone, or do we return it to the owner? Sometimes the choice that is good and right is more difficult, and we don't get a reward for it. But the more we read God's word, the better we understand how to live our lives and to make those choices. So I want you to think this week about what you would do for a Klondike bar. So let us pray. Dear God, be with us as we walk through life and make important decisions. Help us to do the right thing and to walk away from bad choices that tempt us. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, thanks for coming up. 
As the children go back to be with their folks, uh, we come to our time of uh, offering, and so I would invite the ushers to come forward for this morning's offering. Today's scripture lesson is from John 13, verses 19 through 30. I tell you this now before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Very truly I tell you, whoever receives one whom I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. 
After saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, very truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining close to his heart. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So while reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, do quickly what you are going to do. Now, no one knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the common purse, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the festival, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the piece of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. This is the word of God for the people of God.
Thank you, Chancellor Choir. That was beautiful. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, children can say the craziest things. <laughs> and doing children's messages, you never know exactly what they will say. So I remember this one time I was doing a children's message, and I was using a, a, a can of pop, soda pop, and um, so I asked the question to start off the children's message, what's your favorite drink? What, what do you like to drink? And uh, you had children that said Mountain Dew. You had children who said Pepsi. You had children who said, I had one child who said iced tea. So, uh, but um, my son Christopher, yeah, everyone can look at him. <laughs> he, uh, he happened to say that his favorite drink, and he said this with a lot of passion, was beer. <sighs> ah, so when, when I caught my composure after he said that, I was like, do you mean root beer? And he says, yeah, that's what I meant. So, <laughs> so uh, you just never know what children are going to say, and sometimes they catch you off guard, but it's always fun to hear what, uh, what what can happen, you know. I bring that up because everything that was leading up to Jesus' death on the cross, nothing caught him by surprise. There wasn't something that, that popped up that wasn't a part of his plan. Everything came together exactly how God wanted it. And so I am starting a new sermon series by Andy Stanley's book, Bad Boys of Easter. And in that book, it brings up certain people that had an impact on Jesus throughout Holy Week, throughout Good Friday. And none of them were there by an accident. It was all a part of God's Plan. And the reason I'm, I'm bringing up this message is because there's a little bit of these people in each and every one of you and me. There's a little bit of each and every one in all of us. Today's character had three sides. The right side, the wrong side, and the what's in it for me side. Today's character is Judas Iscariot. And it's important to know that Judas was a follower of Jesus right in the beginning. He wasn't an afterthought or a last-minute disciple. Judas, although we don't know when he became one of the disciples, we do know that he was with Jesus those three years. Judas would have seen Jesus heal the leper. Jesus would have seen him turn water into wine. Jesus, Judas would have seen Jesus feed the 5,000. Judas was there for everything. And when Jesus was picking his 12 disciples, he started with Peter and Andrew. Then he moved to James and John, Matthew, and then his name was called. Judas was in the inner 12, and he was with a man he thought was the Messiah. Now, it's difficult to know someone from this very little sliver of, of scripture that we have, but what motivated Judas? What was his motivation? What fears did he have? What dreams did he have? Well, we can know from this short section of scripture that Judas, he was a complicated man with conflicting desires and an inner battle raging inside of him. And we can say, we can see from Scripture that Judas, 
had a temptation for two things, money and power. Judas heard all the things that Jesus said and misapplied its meaning. Now, here's a couple exa- here's a three examples. In Mark chapter 10, verses 29 through 30, it says, Truly I tell you, no one who has left home or brother or sister or mother or father or child or field for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in the present age. Home, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, field along with persecution. And in the age to come, eternal life. A hundred times. That's a great multiplier. And so when Judas heard that, he thought, no matter what I give up, I'm going to receive so much more. Granted, Judas also, he ignored the part where it said that they're going to face persecution. But to him, that wasn't a part of what life was supposed to be like with Jesus. And in Matthew chapter 19, 28, it says, Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who follow me will also sit on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Thrones. That's power. Whoever sits on a throne is rich. Judas loved that idea. And then you have John 14, 12. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do The works I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. Like I said, Judas saw all of the miracles that Jesus did. Could you imagine conjuring something up from nothing? Or healing someone who had a dangerous disease of leprosy? Casting out demons? That's a lot of power. I think Judas, he was blinded to Jesus' agenda. He emphasized the parts that aligned with his agenda and then ignored the ones that didn't fit the narrative. Imagine Judas' frustration and confusion as he saw Jesus pass up opportunity after opportunity to seize earthly power. There are multiple times where many, multiple people followed Jesus and they would listen to him for hours, days. That could have been Jesus' army. He could have raised up the troops, but he never did that. People used to give expensive gifts to Jesus. He could amass a fortune, and maybe that fortune would come to me as well. But he didn't do it. Jesus could make items materialize, turn water into wine, feed 5,000 with two fish and five loaves. But Jesus never capitalized on his power. In fact, when he was in the wilderness... Having ate for 40 days and 40 nights, when the devil came and tempted him, he said, I will not make bread, make these stones into bread. Jesus never capitalized on any of that stuff. In fact, he did the opposite. The more popular he grew, the more reclusive he became. He would sneak away from the crowds. Where Judas wanted him to energize the crowd and build up his army... Jesus would go away. And later in his ministry, his tone took on a more disturbing tone. He talked about suffering, rejection, and death. Judas was disturbed because suffering and rejection and death did not follow his idea of an earthly king. Judas wanted Jesus to be a powerful king so that he can ensure an important position in his courts. And there's a progression for Judas. And it's going the wrong way. 
But probably the triggering event for, for Judas, the one that, that made him give up on Jesus altogether, was the event that took place in the house of Simon the leper. And Mary, the, brother, the sister of Lazarus, comes to Jesus and anoints his feet with oil with expensive perfume. And Jesus is happy, but Judas is furious. And in John chapter 12, verses 4 through 7, we see this interaction with Jesus, Judas. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's worth a year's wage. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and as a keeper of the money bay, he used to keep, help himself to whatever was put in it. Jesus said, leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. So Judas wanted Jesus to sell the perfume, not be bathed in it. The revolutionary cause that Judas thought he was a part of was dead in his eyes. Judas was fed up, and although he was a close personal friend to Jesus, three years walking with him, it was at this point that Judas decided that he had to get something for himself. But how? Well, he knew the, he knew the Pharisees. They didn't like him. And so on Tuesday of Holy Week, Judas struck a deal to portray Jesus. He struck a deal to find a time where he would be alone, where the crowd wasn't nearby. And in order for him to do that, the Pharisees paid him 30 pieces of silver. Can you imagine how awkward that would have been at the Last Supper? As Judas moved, the sound, the jingling of those coins that made a noise in his pockets was a reminder of his betrayal. But the moment of any guilt, any remorse, left him by one event. Jesus grabbed a towel, put it around his waist, and washed the disciples' feet. Who has ever heard of a king washing feet? Judas had nothing but contempt and pity for Jesus and the group of followers who were going, fast, going down faster than the Titanic. At least he was going to get something out of it. And in our scripture lesson for today, Jesus was troubled in spirit, the Bible says. Now, commentators believe that this is one of the strongest expressions that is used in the gospel to explain what Jesus was going through. Describing his sorrowed heart, the Lord was terribly upset. Why? He was feeling his constant love for Judas and yet recognizing Judas's betrayal back at him. Jesus is not taking this event lightly. He's troubled in spirits. John MacArthur wrote this of this uh, emphasis. He said, Jesus treated Judas with the same patience and grace that he, uh, that he treated the other disciples. We cannot comprehend how Jesus Jesus knew Judas was predetermined to be the betrayer, and yet he genuinely loved Judas and held out to him the offer of salvation right to the very end. And so what happens next is that Judas led the guards to where Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And with whips, and chains, they bound Jesus. But the next thing that happened was so unexpected for Judas. He knew that they hated Jesus. 
but he didn't know how much. They knew that the Pharisees uh, could possibly punish Jesus, maybe lecture, banish. But the one thing that Judas did not think was going to happen was that Jesus was going to die. In Matthew 27, 3 through 5, when Judas the betrayer saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and turned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is this to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The tragedy of all of this is that Judas gained a 30-piece world, yet lost his soul. What was once extraordinary to him had huge value one minute was worthless the next. Those 30 pieces meant so little to him now that he threw those coins into the temple and leaves. Now, an interesting note that uh, the NRSV says, in verse 3, it says, that when Judas, his betrayer, saw Jesus was condemned, he repented. Now, when we think of the word repent, we think change of heart or turning your back on sin. That's what repentance means, but Judas didn't repent. Actually, the New Living Translation, it says that he regretted his decision. He was filled with remorse. Judas was overcome with regret that he had played a part in an innocent man being executed. Judas was a thief. He was selfish. He was hard. But he never thought of himself as a murderer. By throwing the 30 pieces back, he was trying to clean his hands. But the problem was the blood was already there. So, so the question that I believe to address, how should we understand Judas' suicide? If he changed his feelings on the whole thing, why did he hang himself? Well, to answer that, I think we have to compare Judas and Peter. Because Peter was another disciple who denied ever knowing Jesus three times. When Jesus needed him most, Judas ran away, turned his back. But after Peter turned his back on Jesus, we see at the end of John a wonderful picture of repentance and forgiveness that Jesus offers. The scene opens where Peter is asked by Jesus, do you love me more than these? And he says it, Three times. The same amount of times that Jesus, that Peter denied Jesus, ever knowing him. And then Jesus says, feed my lambs, my sheep. Jesus had forgiven and given, given him back the call that he thought was forfeited from his actions. But Judas, on the other hand, instead of moving to Jesus in repentance, decided to hang himself. He was filled with shame and regrets after being with Jesus these three years. And after seeing so many miracles, Judas's heart was very hard and he was blinded. He couldn't see that forgiveness and restoration was available in Jesus. And here's the big picture for us to know. Rebellion without repentance leads to tragedy. Let me say that again. Rebellion without repentance leads to tragedy. And so what does all this have to do with us? 
Well, what motivates you to follow Jesus? Why are you a follower of Jesus? Is it because of salvation? Is it because of power? Is it because of anything that you could think of? What is the reason why? Or is it out of gratitude for what God has done to us through Jesus Christ? Something to wrestle with this week. Also, do you have a 30 pieces of silver thing that's staring in you in the face that causes you to do that which you know God doesn't want you to do? Do you have a 30 pieces silver challenge in your life? You see, if Judas would have come to Jesus, he would have received the repentance and forgiveness that only he could give. But instead he held on to it, held on to the shame, held on to the grief. God can free you from that. And remember that there's a big difference between regret and repentance. Regret leads to shame. Repentance is a turning away, a turning away from the sin and coming to God. And we are reminded that through repentance, we are forgiven. We are set in a right relationship with God. And because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, we have the hope of eternity right before us. In closing, um, there's a, uh, a story I'd like to share with you. A.J. Gordon, who was a pastor in Boston a long, long time ago, he met a boy who had a rusty cage and in the rusty cage, he had some pigeons. Gordon inquired, where did he get the birds? And the boy said, well, I caught them in the field over there. To which the pastor said, well, what are you going to do with the birds? And the little boy said, well, I don't know. I'm going to play with them, I guess. And then I'm going to feed them to my cats. When all of a sudden, Pastor Gordon offered to buy those birds from the boy. Why would you do that, the boy said. They aren't singing birds. He says, I'll give you $2. Now, in that day, $2 was a lot of money for the birds and the cage. It's a deal, the boy said. But, mister, you have a bad bargain. So they exchanged the money, and the boy went whistling away with the two coins in his hands. Pastor Gordon walked around the church with the cage. He opened the door, and those birds soared to the heaven. When Sunday came around, Gordon took that empty cage, that empty rusted cage, to the pulpit and used it as an illustration. The boy who had sold the birds said they don't sing well, Pastor Gordon said. But when I released them, their wings went heavenward, and it seemed to me as they were singing, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. And Pastor Gordon finished the message by saying, you and I have been held captive by sin and death, but Christ purchased our pardon and set us free. And when a person has a life-changing experience, he too can sing as those birds sing, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. As we close this message, recognize who our Redeemer is. Recognize his great love for you, for me. And recognize that he was the one willing to pay 
to set us free from the cage, the rusted cage that we were in, so that we can have hope, peace, love, and salvation. Would you please pray with it? Pray with me. Let's pray. Gracious and almighty God, we thank you so very much that long ago you purchased our rusty cage that held us captive, that you freed us from the penalty which is death, how Satan wanted to feed us to his cats. But you said that, no, we are worth so much, worth because of what you did on the cross, and you proved it. Father God, we thank you for your great love found in Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, any hindrance, any 30 pieces, whatever that might be, that you would free us from the bondage that that has and that you would set us on the right foot. We pray all this in Jesus' most holy and precious name. Amen. Please stand as you are able and join in the hymn of dedication projected on the screen and in the larger hymnal, number 581. Before we pray, (laughs) 
A reminder that we have the Lenten study in the, uh, the gym, and everyone's welcome to attend. Whether you have a book or not, we'd just love for you to be there. So uh, with that, let us receive this benediction. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, as we go forth from this place, may our hearts soar in your love, and may that love spread to those we come in contact with and those who love seems a foreign idea. May you be with us in all that's before us. And I pray this in Jesus Christ's most holy and precious name. Amen. You may be seated.